Good afternoon and welcome to the Nancy Margolis Gallery. I am Nancy Margolis and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this first of this not. season's conversation with the artist, Ryan Rago. Present Memory is the debut solo exhibition for the artist and is a collection of 11 oil paintings we are showing in our online viewing room from September 14th through October 29th. It is my pleasure to introduce the Associate Director of Nancy Margolis Gallery, Lillian Day Thorpe, and to introduce as well, Philip R. Jackson, the moderator for this afternoon's conversation with the artist, Brian Rago. Thank you for coming, and I know that you're gonna have a wonderful experience here this afternoon. I'll now pass it over to Lillian to carry on. Thank you. Hello, I am Lillian Thorpe, the Associate Director of Nancy Margolis Gallery. I am very pleased to introduce the two speakers in today's event. Brian Rego received his BFA at the University of South Carolina in 2004, where he was the recipient of the Ed Yajin Award for Distinguished Undergraduate Work. In 2007, he received his MFA at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And shortly afterwards, he co-founded the painting collective known as Percepti Perceptual Painters. Rego has taught at numerous schools and programs, including the University of South Carolina, Columbia College, Mississippi University, Jerusalem Studio School, Art New England, and Mount Gretna School of Art. Today, Rego lives in South Carolina with his wife and four children. The moderator of today's talk is Philip R. Jackson. A representational artist, Jackson is a professor of art at the University of Mississippi in Oxford, where he currently teaches and heads the painting area. Jackson's work is included in the permanent collections of art museums in Evansville and Fort Wayne, Indiana, Huntsville, Alabama, Jackson, and Meridian, Mississippi. His paintings have been featured in numerous publications, including Art in America, Southwest Art, American Art Collector, and American Artist Magazine. Jackson has received awards from the Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation in Montreal, Canada, Air Seren B, Mississippi Museum of Art, Mississippi Arts Commission, Tyrone Guthrie Foundation in Monaghan, Ireland, and numerous scholarly research grants from the University of Mississippi. He received his BFA from the Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio, and his MFA from the Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio. He studied abroad at Studio Art Centers International in Florence, Italy. Jackson is a member of Zuxis, a painting collective of artists focusing on the still life, and his work is represented by the Chris Winfield Gallery in Carmel, California. Regarding the format of today's talk, um, we will open it up to questions and comments from the audience about halfway through. Feel free at any time during the conversation to type a question or a comment into the chat box, and then I will read it aloud at the end. You can also click the raise hand icon and I will call on you after the discussion. Finally, before I hand it over to Philip and Brian, I'm going to show the 11 paintings in present memory.
Okay, it is my pleasure now to hand it over to Brian and to Philip. Go ahead. Well, it's, it's, um, it's my pleasure to, to be moderator. Nancy and Lillian, thank you so much for getting this together and allowing me to be part. And Brian, thank you for uh, the invitation. Um, thank you also for all that are here. I'm excited to, to share um, some of the thoughts that um, Brian and I have discussed kind of over the years. Brian and I have known each other for some time um, and uh, I've invited him to Mississippi to teach, co-teach a, a landscape painting workshop um, and we became short friends quickly um, and share a great uh, lot of interest in the same kind of things in painting. Brian is, is an incredible teacher alongside his paintings. Many of you may know that. Um, so if you ever have the opportunity, you should take a workshop from him. Um, uh, so I, I, Brian, you, you may have something you want to say to get us started, but I have some questions whenever you're ready. Um, but I just wanted to start with that. Thank you. Just as uh, a formal um, kind of start, I'd just like to say thank you to Nancy and to Lillian uh, for putting this on and for all the hard work that you put into the show. Um, and of course, to you, Philip, for um, moderating this talk. And uh, just for everybody who has showed up, it's uh, good to be with you. So we're, we're excited. Uh, these, are, these are some things that we um, have talked a great deal about over the years in, in Brian's work. And I'm, I'm a huge fan, as I'm sure many of you are. Um, so, there, so we want to kind of dive into some of the obvious things that are, that are kind of seen in his work and then hopefully um, mine a little bit and go a little deeper um, as things progress. So you know, one of the things that sort of I, I think about, uh, Brian, just as a general standpoint is, you know, there are two obvious subjects in your work, uh, both the landscape and the figure. Um, can you talk a little bit about how um, you address the significance, the significance of both um, and their intended interaction with the viewer? Um, well, to start off, I'll say that the landscape and the figure are symbolic in the work. <clears throat> so um, being that way, they are able to, to hold um, to contain a lot of different levels of meaning for me um, as, as I develop the work, which <clears throat> is purely intuitive. Um, as, as the image develops, I, I, uh, I interact with the landscape first uh, from life because it's dynamic and it's, uh, it's ever-changing. And it, it keeps me sort of like in this dizzying state where what I feel like makes sense at the moment begins to change into something else the next moment. And the forms that develop, develop from these um, cumulative experiences that I have on location uh, that that are surprising and that really don't make sense at the time when I'm making them. So I bring them back to the studio and uh, sort of see what's there. Um, and, and there's usually something there that I can, I can develop further. Um, the, the figure, the figures come later. And they begin to like once once I understand or begin to understand the the way that the narrative is is taking shape, um, the way that and, and it's really the way that the landscape begins to interact with itself in the space in the painting. The figures are they represent me. Um, in different aspects. It doesn't matter if it's you know a figure that's old or young, male or female, whatever ethnicity, like they're all aspects of, of me. And uh, in my past experiences or even things I'm currently um, affected by. The interesting thing is that the the viewer when when they look at the work they bring with them 
all of their history and, and their ideas of what things are. And so then the painting takes on a completely different role than what it does for me. And, and oftentimes I'm surprised by the way people respond to the work. They see things that I don't see. They are nourished in ways that the painting is able to touch aspects in them that are different from me. And I, I um, in, in a way, when I talk to viewers, it helps to make the painting more complete. Um, but the landscape and the figure are, are really, they're really important for me. Uh, one, because of, of my childhood. And I spent a lot of time in the mountains in California. My family, we had a cabin there. And, and that's when I really fell in love with the landscape as a boy, as a little boy. Um, I learned how to do a lot of things um, as a boy in the landscape. <clears throat> and, um, and of course, the people that I've met over the years and um, my family, my, my friends, my enemies, like all of those contribute to um, it's very interesting narratives that sort of find their way into the painting in this organic, intuitive manner, you know? And so they are, uh, for the paintings, they're just ways that I can express through a visual pictorial language that I'm not able to otherwise. That's great, Brian. Um, you know, in talking about more about the narrative that you find in the landscape when you're painting and then both outside and then coming into the studio, I was noticing some of the titles on your, on your paintings and how some of them seem more straightforward, Girl on Dock, East Bay Street, but then there are two that sort of, you know, lend itself more directly, I guess, to this narrative that's more present, maybe in your mind, in the painting. And I know they're in all the paintings. But in those two titles, I was really curious, um, the one, As One Knows Another, um, and then the other one uh, was Succession. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, the interest in, or the uh, focus on that kind of a title for those paintings? Yeah, that, that's actually a really good question. Um, so I, when I title my paintings, I, I'm really careful not to, um, not to give the painting a title that I feel like will influence the viewer too much um, in terms of, of, you know, how to approach it, what they should see and what they should come away with from, from engaging with, with the painting. Because of what I'd said before, I, I like what they bring to the painting and how the painting can interact with them. But <clears throat> there are some paintings that I make that, um, for me, the narrative takes a direction, it takes, it, it really takes a direction that is so surprising and is so personal that the title that I give it, um, it, it seems, the painting seems to warrant the title in, in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. As one knows, another is, it's kind of expressing my, complete sense of awe when I'm with another person. You know, it doesn't matter what their background is or what they're into, what they're not into, anything like that. I feel like when I'm with another person, you know, I'm, I'm looking through one of NASA's telescopes at like billions of galaxies. There's such, there's such an expansiveness that's there that, that really brings me to a place of awe. And so that painting is just kind of about what it means to, to know that interior expansiveness, you know, to get to catch a glimpse of that. Um, which to me is so much more profoundly beautiful than the facade 
you know, the exterior, you know. You know, that can be beautiful too. But, you know, but there are many times when it's not. But what's inside is, it's incomparably more beautiful. And um, <clears throat> so I, I guess, so some of the experiences that I've had regarding, regarding that, and I know that, that the, there are two figures in there, in there that are nuns. And the other figure is, is this, you know, undesirable character on the other side of this, this gate, but then the, the gates sort of dematerializing through this, this exchange of acknowledgement where they really see each other, they, they, they see each other, you know? And, and, and that, like, that kind of thing to me is what breaks down barriers. It's what, it's what brings, it's what unifies us. You know, and it's it's uh, when we really see each other, and and when we, when we really know each other, like on a profound, deep and personal level. The other painting, Succession. <laughs> so that one's weird, and um, I'm I'm still working through that one, to be honest with you, because a lot of times there are there are paintings that I make where I know that there's something going on, um, but I try not to get my head around it too much because once I think I know what it's about, then I feel like I miss something really important. So I, uh, I don't push it. I don't push the awareness. I just, I let, I let it kind of unfold as it needs to. And, and hopefully, I can receive it um, as, as I need to. But succession, um, you know, the pair of legs on the bottom is that a woman who is, you know, resting on a blanket. She, she dead, you know, like there are all these kind of, she passed out, you know, whatever. Um, there, you know, there are kind of these, these questions that go along with it. There, there's this dead bird on, on the grass with these feathers, this plume of feathers coming off of its, its body, you know? And there's this creepy dark figure. Is he examining the, <laughs> the fence? Is he looking at, you know, what, what is his relationship to what's going on? And it's, it's, a, it's a bizarre thing to me, the way that, and, I, and this is kind of personal to me, but in the way that people can begin to I don't want to say dehumanize one another, but like over things that are that are just so temporary. We'll we'll cast off, we'll be willing to sacrifice things that are of far greater value. And um and so much damage can be done in that in that in that exchange. Um, and families can be torn apart and, and all, all kinds of things can happen. And so succession is, is not just about a passing on of one's possessions and, and um, you know, property and things like that, but it's also passing on of one's problems, you know, um, and uh, conflicts for others to resolve that's great thank you brian so um another part of this that that i'm really interested in is you know because you you paint i would say historically in a fairly traditional format in terms of the scope of painting um but there are so many modern you know kind of modes of thought happening in your work um and one could see it in, in a multitude of ways you know, the obvious, I guess, way that is seen pictorially is um, the twisting, the stretching, the kind of rumbling and continual movement that's happening in the space, both by the, the landscape itself. Um, and then also the unbalanced or movement of the figures, like some of the figures are pointing outside of the picture plane or um, some of them are off balance, like they're, they're being shifted by the space itself. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit more about what that is? And, and when we look at that in these paintings, what are we to think about? And when we see those things? That's a good question. Um, I suppose I, I could start off by saying that is just uh, sort of like an intuitive response to um, what I experience when I'm on location or just when I'm looking, just when I'm looking at something out and about, you know, it's, it's disorienting to me um, and when I'm just in the midst of it, surrounded by it, happening all the time, everywhere. And um, I guess I see something, uh, it's not really a pattern or anything like that. Uh, it's not a pattern, but it's more of like a cause. It's like a, a series of cause and effect that, that, that happens um, in, in front of me or like the corner of my eye or something, right? And uh, like in the periphery. And I, sometimes I'm like, I think I'm, I'm straining to uncover one aspect of the subject when really it's the split second in my peripheral vision that gives me everything I need. That split second, that unexpected, just, you know, gift, right? This, this moment where everything kind of comes together in this strange way lasts for a moment, but somehow stays with me, just stays with me. And, um, that is a point of reference that uh that I, I built i built on from there and and the picture kind of expands the form and all of its actions the forms and all of their actions um and their expressions are sort of built from this moment in the painting and the way that they're built the way that they're made Again, it, it is intuitive um, and it, it comes from part of it. One aspect of it comes from the way that I, I sense the forms are behaving and, and their, their, their expression and their particular action. And these forms, whether they're like, you know, transparent, um, you know, we could call them volumetric, forms or something right whether they're like inner spaces or whether they're just space that's surrounding um, a visible form an object uh, or something um, they they interact with one another and they change um, so i'll give you an example okay um, <clears throat> so i i can see so for example i'll i'll look at a tree and I'll see its sort of inherent gestural expression by the, you know, its movement, its shape, and how that is articulated in space. But that movement in of itself begins to influence the behavior of the space that surrounds it. Like the space that surrounds it isn't neutral, it's active, and it participates with the tree, it interacts with it. And the tree, in response, uh, engages the space and I, I had uh, you know you, you have these remarkably intelligent and gifted people throughout your life who say these things to you like is the tree shaping the space or is the space shaping the tree you know that, that kind of you know way of thinking about things and it's it's this beautiful negotiation between the two of them that that really creates um this this kind of this kind of powerful moment, this interaction, a force. <clears throat> it's almost like uh, two hands, like shaping clay, right? And um, and so that's that's kind of how you know, in a kind of, kind of in a clumsy way. I'm sorry, but it it's hard for me to describe what I mean through what I'm saying, <clears throat> but um, but that's in a way is is how how I, I sense things interacting with one another, like in like in, in a landscape. Um, when I when I bring the painting to the studio and I begin working on that, 
then it's I'm relying on on memory and and how those experiences impacted and influenced what I was seeing at the time. Um, and then really unusual things happen, like with shapes and how they are generated on the canvas, um, color and texture. It's um, it's it's surprising to me because it's like I I don't see it until it's there. I just I have a sense of the I have a sense of the feeling that I want, like you know, but I don't exactly know what it looks like until I begin making it. And then I, as I make it, I, 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 I kind of sense whether it's, yeah, this is kind of right or not, or, and then I begin to form it and the way that the space is forming it on location. So I, I guess um, for the viewer, I, I hope that in, in, in one sense or another, that the viewer is able to experience what I'm experiencing. Um, but even more than that, though, it's, it's, I'm hoping that, that uh, in some small way, I can contribute to the, the way that the viewer thinks about seeing, thinks about looking and experiencing these things, the landscape or the figure, or, or you know, um, because that's what happened for me. Uh, and, and especially with like, you know, like the fresco paintings and I mean, you know, there, there are just so many amazing examples you know, in the history of painting that, that are able to impart these, these gifts within their, you know, within their own work. Um, but that's something that, uh, that I've, I've experienced just looking at, at these different paintings, whether they're, I mean, heck, you know, whether it's like Bonnard or, or you know, Brock or Morandi, you know, Piero, you know, who, you know, so many painters, uh, Cezanne, right? But like, there's so many painters that, that contribute to these ways of seeing. And, um, and so anyway, that's my hope is that when the viewer encounters the work that they're able to sense that and, and be moved to a different, different place. Brian, I'm sorry about that. I, I wasn't annoyed. That was my dog Jobin that sighed. <laughs> um, I, I really appreciate the way you're talking about this because it sort of lends itself to the next question that I have is, you know, what is really obvious in your work is the sense of surface, you know, that there's a real physicality to the way that you think about the materiality of paint, like the pain is, pain is subject in your work. I mean, it, it becomes a subject in your work. Um, it, and, not, and, and not only that, it just describes form and, and the, the pictorial space that we're looking at, but that um, it becomes a, a real visceral experience. I mean, the way that we interact with it, we're not only thinking about um, what we're seeing, but um, what is happening as this materiality, like sort of um, reveals itself. Um, can you talk a little bit about how and what, you know, sort of how you think about paint, what paint is and the way that you use it to describe uh, these spaces and things that you're talking about? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a very interesting kind of relationship that I have to paint. Uh, and I, I don't I don't quite understand it, but I, I, I've always related to it through the human body. Um, it's just, it's felt like, it's felt like I was just forming flesh, you know? I don't, I don't, that sounds kind of weird, but um, I'm not really quite sure how else to explain it. Like organs, blood, bones, tissue, um, skin. It's just, I, I think of the painting being developed like a body, you know, um, and the way that I respond through the paint uh, is really a part of the painting's gesture. And in, 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 a, way, in, in a way that a form could be expressed um, and before me, you know, uh, I, want the, I want the painting 
to be expressed in that way too. Um, I want the paint, my hope is that the painting is its own body, its, its own flesh um, mm. with a heartbeat, with a pulse, you know, um, and it's, it's living, right? And it's, it's moving. Uh, and, and the physical articulation of the paint on the surface is, is a part of, is an aspect of, of that, of that movement, that gesture, that form. So pictorially, it's, I've, I've always been deeply touched, um, surprised when a painting is able to move me pictorially and physically. It just appeals to me on such a deep level. It, I can feel it inside, you know, like I feel it inside of myself. And, um, and so that to me signifies that it's appealing to my sensibilities. Um, and there's something important there to, you know. Um, and so when I, when I work, um, a lot of times I, I use a lot of paint and, and that, that, that physicality of paint allows me to, um, sorry guys, one of my children are having a tantrum. Um, it's difficult for me to, to stay focused. Um, but when, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm, when I, when, I, when I'm doing something, when I'm articulating something like a gesture of a movement, the expediency of that movement, the specific texture of a form, um, the physicality of paint becomes, uh, another way to, to, I guess, to give that expression more volume. And I don't mean like literal volume. I, I just mean in the sense of, of depth, you know, maybe it, it allows the viewer to experience it from a different angle, different perspective, different vantage point. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Lillian, I guess this is our halfway point and you probably want to step in at this point and, and uh, ask for questions, so. That sounds great. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful conversation. And um, now if anyone has a question that they'd like to ask or comment, please feel free. Um, you can either click the raise hand icon or type something in the chat box. Uh, we do have one comment already from Lorraine who says, Brian, thank you for your comments regarding the figures and how they arrive in the work. I've wondered about that. They always look so spontaneous and firsthand. And personally, I totally agree. I think that what you said earlier about, you know, the experience of catching something in the periphery of your vision, um, I feel that sense of fleetingness in your figures. And I think you just articulated that really well. I have a question. Um, I was wondering, you've spoken before about um, the concept of perceptual painting. And I know you've created this, you know, art collective of painters called Perceptual Painters. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, what exactly you think of as perceptual painting and why that, why you are drawn to that genre. Um, I think it can have a few definitions. So I'm just curious to hear, you know, what that means to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, that's a good question. And I'll say, Lillian, um, the way the way that I, I think about perceptual painting has definitely changed, you know, evolved uh, over the years. But you know, this collective, which has been very important to me, and I know for a lot of people who've been a part of it, um, was formed really kind of in a in a um, in a way it was formed while in grad school. Mm -hmm. And uh, because there were so many people there that um, were like-minded um, that post-grad school, when we were all kind of, you know, you, you get this experience of being out of grad school and you're, you know, you're not a part of this, this incredible uh, community, this inspiring community, you know, and you're sort of out on your own. And it was just a way to, <clears throat> it was a way to kind of keep one's one's hand on the pulse you know of that 
And so at first it started off just being a couple of people and we were just, we were just critiquing each other's work really. Um, but then, uh, you know, it just turned into something more um, and we found that we could do more with it. Perceptual painting at that time for me was um, the way that I wanted to use it um, was just working from observation and working from life and just, you know, no other way. You know? um, but, and that was really important for me as a painter because there was so much that I needed to learn and still need to learn um, when I, when I work from life, uh, there's, there's just so much, so much, um, and nature, <clears throat> like Saro, Cezanne, like a lot of painters, you know, talk about this in their writing, how, how nature is, is like the greatest teacher, right? And there's just so much to learn from that. So working, my, my feeling was, well, if I work from nature exclusively, then I'm gonna learn so many things. And I did, but there's also something that I was missing, which was the cultivation of visual memory, um, which was, you know, being in a place and, and like relying on memory and allowing that memory to propel me, to be present with the subject again, but in a different way where as I began to work more from memory and as, as I began to work a, away from the subject and just relied on just pure invention and um, my imagination and memory, I realized that I needed to cultivate visual memory, which, which kind of thrust me to be present with the subject. It compelled me to be present with the subject in a deeper way than I was before, you know? Uh, before I would just kind of like observe, almost like mechanically, just, you know, observe, coldly observe and record what I was saying. But this process has, has been kind of pushing me to be present in a way that I feel like it's much more human, right? All encompassing and allowing things to seep into the senses and really being present with it so that I can take all of that back with me to the studio and, and have a chance to, to be present with it. And that to me is much more perceptual now than the way I thought of perceptual painting in the beginning. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. And um, I'll read this question from Stacy, and I think you pretty much just answered what she was asking, but um, she said, how would you say your work has evolved over time? Are you looking for something different in your work now compared to say 10 years ago? Is there something that has stayed consistent in your work? That's a great question. That was from Stacy. Yes. Um, and Lorraine, I wanna thank you for your question too. It was really good. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's funny because when I first began, so, my, my work went through a, a pretty big, big change. Like it went through a pretty substantial disruption uh, around 2010. And I had, so I kind of built up this working vernacular for painting that the academy um, sort of loaned to me, you know, like it, it was so important to, to work within that, that way of, of thinking and painting uh, for many, many different reasons. But I found that I, I was, I was sort of introduced to different ways of seeing and thinking that caused me to have to sort of start over. And, um, and, and I, I could only paint the landscape. I, could only, I couldn't paint figures at the time. The, it was just the landscape. And it was, it was working with like simple orchestration and arrangement of shapes and color and things like that. Very geometric. Um, stark geometry it was really kind of strange and then that moved into a more naturalistic um level of kind of imagery and representation and then people would comment like all the time there are no fig why aren't there any figures blah, 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 for different reasons you know 
they they would tell me that they feel the fit they would they would tell me when looking at these landscapes i feel the figure i feel the figure but i there's no figure in here right and um and then i i, I so I, I began really thinking about that and you know asking myself why wasn't it painting the figure and so i began to i read this article one time and this this artist was saying how when he would develop painting it was like it would be like people would would come to his door right and knock and he would let them in and invite them for tea you know and have a chat and then they would leave but sometimes they would stay and that was he was describing his process of developing the imagery and painting and so I, I began letting the people at the door in and you know seeing what that was all about and um and that's, that's how I kind of got to where I am now. But to answer Stacey's question, yeah, 10 years ago, I realized that I had to paint differently because I needed something different from the work, Stacey. And I'm still, I'm still, I'm still chasing that down. I, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not there. I'm just not there. Um, and, I, you know, I feel like I feel like in some sense, I'm always going to need something more from the work, you know, which I'm glad for. Um, but I, I do sense that I have still a, a very long way to go. Thank you, Brian. Um, we have a few more questions. This one is from Liffy, and she asks, how important is it for you to stay in Charleston? Do you ever crave to be in a different place or do you feel like this is the only place you have to ever be to do your art? Hmm. Good question. Well, I would love to go back to Italy. Hmm. Um, that was a pretty special time. And I do love being in Mississippi as well. So that's a great place. I've, I've found that um, being in Charleston happened because of, of like life circumstances that were unavoidable. Um, and so what I've done throughout the years is I've, I've decided to use my environment as a, a point of departure for making work. When I was getting married, my painting professor that I invited to the wedding, he pulled me aside after everything was done. We had the reception party. We did. He was like, just paint your life, just paint your life. And it was great. It was the perfect advice. It was the perfect advice because when I began to have kids, I thought my painting career, you know, oh, it's, it's over kind of thing that it, it's really, it was a gift. It was like, it was becoming fuller. I, had, I was given more material. I was given so much more to work with and, and to work from. Not that I, I don't think about my children like that, you know, it's like material, but like, but you know, but just, it makes life rich. And, and so I find that wherever I am, whether it's in Charleston or Columbia, or if I'm visiting a place like Oxford, Mississippi or Italy or wherever, it's that richness is right there. And I, again, I, I work to be really present with it. So I can, I, can, so I can bring that into the work. Thank you. That's great. Um, we have a question from Elise Dean Wolf, and she says, hi, Brian. Thank you for taking the time to speak about your work. What struck me the first time I saw your paintings was how it feels like you are really perceiving the subject. I think this is achieved mainly through what I'd call peripheral distortion, where the sense of perspective is more observational than what would be called accurately. Is this a conscious decision or something that came about naturally? Great question. This was Elise. Yes. Um, thank you, Elise. I, I would say that it's definitely kind of more intuitive. Uh, it happens kind of naturally. Um, you know, it's important to learn like perspective, you know, like the, as schematics and different things like that. But it's even better to break it, right? Like you, you can you can really begin to take aspects from different things and you see how it works. You're like, oh, that's why that's why they they you know use perspective like this and kind of you know that kind of thing. But for me, it's it's I I really am interested. Um, I, I'm really interested in how, like, when I look and, and when I'm when I'm 
in the space. I'm responding like things that are far come near, right? Things that are, that are near move to a further place. And this, this constant diet is a sort of like constant negotiation. The, the question of where something is like location, that's a really big question. Where is it, right? Because it's everywhere. And, and you know, through the painting, you're making decisions and you arrive at, at this location, at this place. But then even as you do, you know, this, this one shape, this one form can have multiple locations simultaneously, depending on where else you look in, in the image. One element can have multiple functions. And so then the painting becomes something that's not seen as one layer, but multi-layered. And, and the painting reveals itself through these layers. It's like a moving image, right? Um, and, and the space is, is an aspect of that. The space doesn't belong to one, you know, schematic of perspective with vanishing points and all that kind of stuff. It's something that is, it changes depending on how one looks and where one looks and what one sees and like the implications, you know, of, of, of those different instances of vision, right? And so that's what I'm wanting to bring into the painting mm -hmm. are, are just those, those different aspects. That makes sense. Um, we have a couple of technical questions coming up. Um, this one is from Benny Milton and he asks, how does your color palette, color choices relate to your aesthetic? Are you locked into your color palette? Great question, Benny. Um, maybe, maybe I am, I don't know. Like I remember uh, I listened to Lucian Freud, you know, he was talking about his color and, and he was saying how he wished, he wished he, he could, he could move into you know, working with these bright, you know, fully saturated high chroma, you know, pigments and, but it just wasn't, it wasn't him, you know, it wasn't his nature. And, and he was uh, almost regret, begrudgingly kind of just settling for these muddy earth tones as he, as he called it, you know, um, he would work with, but he did it well, you know, I, um, and, uh, even Corot, you know, Corot would say, I use very little notes, but I play them well. Um, and I, I wouldn't consider myself to, you know, be there, but like, I would say that my goal is definitely as I respond through color and, and my color sense is changing, it is evolving, um, which is interesting right now. It's sort of like, it's in this weird transition, this weird transitional place. Um, right now especially with the, the the newer work that i'm making but yeah uh the the palette that i use is fairly simple just a white series of yellows reds and blues and i'll throw black on there i've got black on there now i like black a lot um yeah and, and it's it's interesting like i i like to arrive at you know, the secondaries and the tertiaries, I, I like to arrive at those um, and move through the color, you know, and, uh, and feel it through, like, as I'm before the subject and responding to it. And what comes out is what comes out. And, and that's just it, you know, when I'm working on the painting, it takes a little bit to establish a color structure. But then once I, I get a sense of the structure, then I can, yeah, I can take it back to the studio, work on it, develop it, and you know, augment things if, it, if you know, that needs to happen or whatnot. Um, but I've always, I've always like marvel at painters that could just like, go out and buy ten different pigments and just put them on a palette and then use them. You know, but that just isn't my temperament. For sure. Um, thank you. We have another one from Lorraine about technique. Um, if you'd care to share any technical aspects, do you mix anything like medium or sand, et cetera, into your paint? Can you talk about the brushes you use? They look so soft and I can't figure out how you build up those so richly textured surfaces. Yeah, definitely. Um, my brushes are not soft. <laughs> they're, they're really kind of gummed up. Um, I, I do not treat my brushes as well as they deserve to be treated. And 
but that's part of what makes it work. Um, and I, I don't, you know, that was just sort of something I found by accident in a way, but um, the, the brushes, I just use like a, a chunking bristle, you know, brush, natural bristle most of the time and uh, saturate the, I mean, just fill up, you know, the hair of that brush with tons of paint and just put it on. Um, and I just, the, the texture really comes from just multiple durations of building up on it and building up on the paint. I don't put sand in the paint. Um, although if a painting falls off the easel and lands face down in the sand, you know, I'll put it in there, might as well, or bugs or whatever, you know, things like that. Um, but I, I, there is this one medium that I like a lot and uh, I get it from, from Doak, it's called Goop. It's kind of a strange medium, but it works pretty well. It doesn't thicken the paint up really. It's more of like an extender in a way. Um, but I couple that with something else that allows the paint to become a little bit agitated. And um, sometimes it's, that's very beneficial to have that happen. But mostly, honestly, just uh, it's, you know, loading, loading the brush up with a lot of paint, um, putting it down vigorously and um, building, just building up on top of it. Perfect, thank you. Um, this one is from Louise and she asks, do you have a giant lock on your studio door? Is it a challenge to transition from real life for kids to the state of mind that allows you to be present for those fleeting intuitions? Ah, oh, Louise, that's a great question. And the answer is yes. I, I don't have a lock, but I, I certainly, Sometimes wish I did. Um, I'm kidding. Um, no, I, I I love it. My family, they they give so much. I can't even begin to. I couldn't. I couldn't even quantify it. Like it, it just, it's so well infused to the work that I make. Um, that to to try to, to subtract that or take that away would be taking away a huge portion of the work. So. I have to kind of like what I was talking about with the bugs and the sand, you know, you just paint it in there. You just put it in, you know, um, and everything kind of works out later in the end, but no, it, it's, I've, I've had to learn. And I suppose, I, I suppose I, I didn't paint like this at first, um, Louise, but I've, I've had to learn over the years to like transition mentally quickly. And so, yeah, I do have a lock like in my head for sure. Um, I could be right in the middle of a painting and then something happens because my studio is in my house. Something happens and I've got to go take care of a crisis or something, you know, between two kids that are trying to like end each other's lives or something. Um, and then I've got to come back into the studio and then continue working on the painting, right? So yeah, the, the painting changes because I'm certainly not in the same state as I was before, but hopefully what I bring to the painting after, after an experience like that is able to take the painting into a, like kind of move it to a level of expression that it needed. Like I kind of believe that things happen for a reason, you know? And so then what I try to do is use it make the most of it and allow it to um, find its way into the work. See how it goes from there. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, we're nearing the end, but I'll read this comment um, by Elaine Forrest and she writes, you have a real talent for capturing the essence of the place. The minute I see your painting, I know where it, where it is. And yet there is a joyfulness for actually having been there. Mm. Well, that means a lot. Thank you. That was was, that that was um, Elaine Forrest. Elaine Forrest. Wow. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, it's interesting, um, Lillian. Uh, that word "joy" has come up before yes. in the work, and um, that to me is such a, an incredible compliment. I, I that means a great deal. Um, I would say that. That for me, it definitely is a joy, but I think before I experienced the joy, maybe the, the joy is always there, but it's 
definitely also met with a lot of struggle mm -hmm. and um, hard feelings, you know, um, because so much goes into the work. So maybe um, for me, you know, when I experience like things that are just difficult to talk about or like difficult to express and I'm able to move into those, those spaces, move into those feelings and those experiences through the painting, the fact that joy comes out of that to me is such a gift that the viewer can experience and feel the joy is like, that's amazing to me. I, I, I feel like I'm not doing, I, I'll, I'll be, I mean, I'm tortured over the work. I'm tortured over it, you know? But then so a viewer comes to it and experiences joy and like all these things. And that's what I, what I meant earlier. It's like, that's something that's completely out of my control, mm -hmm. but I'm so grateful for it. Perfect. Um, I guess the last comment is by Lisa Adams. And she says, thank you, Brian. You are a true inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think this was wonderful and we're right about at three o'clock. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, Brian's show will remain on view in our viewing room through October 29th. And um, we also have a limited quantity of his printed exhibition catalogs available. So if you're interested in purchasing one, just shoot me an email and I will be happy to give you the details. And I appreciate everyone coming to join this event. I think it was really wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you, Philip. Thank you.